Right, well, um, good morning. Thank you for joining me for what is the third part of the Challenger Languages uh, 11 series for Anne Digital. Um, so I've been in the industry 21 years, and you can probably see from my care-worn features. Um, even nearly 20 years ago, we were delivering things in Java and C Sharp and um, JavaScript. Um, I mean, these languages have evolved, but um, there's a whole world of other ones out there. We claim to, claim to love technology, uh, but why are we stuck with some of these were well, kind of relative relics from uh, many years ago. So they're kind of some of the thoughts that were the seed for this uh, series. So what we're gonna do is briefly go over of an introduction to and and challenger languages and what they are. Um, Going to go over a brief history of TypeScript and what it's all about. Do a live demo of some some of the language features. Not going to go into too much uh, detail, but you know, hopefully give you a good flavour for the language itself. Um, some of the pros and cons, uh, some of which are quite subjective, and also kind of um, well, where do we go from there? and then hopefully a few minutes for a few questions. First of all, that's me, Jeff Watkins, and Digital's Chief Engineer um, and Electronic Musician. Uh, today I'm not going to bore you with 40 minutes of industrial techno, so don't worry. Um, really, I'm interested in, because I've been involved in JavaScript and, uh, over the years, kind of TypeScript is a bit of interest to me personally. Um, I've certainly had fun picking up and uh, having a go with it. So a little bit about Anne Digital for those of us on the call who aren't from Anne Digital. Um, we're a technology focused uh, consultancy. Uh, we have around 720, maybe getting towards 750 now people. And more the majority of whom are in delivery, delivery roles with over 300 technologists. Um, we're technology agnostic, which is one of the reasons why we're always looking for technology trends and accelerators in the market. Um, we help our clients navigate change, build the right products for their users and upskill their teams simultaneously. We actually do this through um, three of our um, facilities, really, three of our offerings, Guide, Build and Teach. And a Guide is, a, is kind of our more traditional consultancy arm. Um, we try to sort of demystify digital transformation with pragmatic uh, strategies focused on driving action. Um, the build part is helping equipping in-house teams with the technology product and delivery expertise. They need to ship better digital products and services at an accelerating pace. And the teach bits are really, I think is the USP, one of the USPs around this. We, we try and develop our, um, our clients' um, digital talent um, in-house both, both through collaborative working and through things like training and boot camps and things like that. So we try, we try to not, not only, we know we're not a land and expand consultancy, what we try to do is help grow um, uh, an enduring capability within the teams we are involved with. That's part of our big hairy audacious goal to try, try and upskill 200,000 people over the next few years in digital skills. So just a few things, um, we're recording this webinar, as you probably heard. Um, screen grabs and photographs might be taken. Most people have got the camera off, but if you just don't want your photograph taken, take your camera off. And uh, hopefully this comes come as no surprise, you know, most people are doing this nowadays, we have kind of a code of conduct, basically it's around not, um, and being a kind of a, a, a um, polite and respectful, really, on these things. Um, so that means trying to keep it as positive, polite, safe, and inclusive as possible. Um, so any any questions or any discussions, try and keep them as inclusive and respectful as possible. I mean, this is a tech talk wall. Hopefully, all interested in this here, um, just try and keep it um, as friendly and welcoming. And just some of the some, Quick terms and conditions are right. Try and stay on mute during the talk. Um, if you have questions, there's a chat pane. Please enter them into there um, as many as you like. We'll try and address as many as you can at the, at the time. Um, if you do have to dash 11.45 in the dot, that's okay. The possibility we'll run over, maybe we won't, hopefully not. So that's kind of, that's kind of the housekeeping out of the way and the introductions. 
So I'm just going to show really what the, the kind of um, the, the schedule is. Now we've already had um, Ruta, the first one on Kotlin, which is um, very well received. And then um, two weeks ago, uh, George, who was on this call today, hi George, uh, did one on Rust. Um, all the speakers in this series have spent a lot of time building up this material themselves. You know, this, this, this has been a personal effort, out, mainly out of hours. We've done a lot of rehearsals and things like that to try and keep it as smooth as possible. Some people, it's their first time doing these. I mean, it's not my first time on the block because I've been here forever. Um, but we've got David Johnson and Go uh, on the 10th of September and Shahid Azim doing uh, Closure on the 24th of September to wrap everything up. Um, so thank you very much for people joining me, especially some, some returning faces, which is nice to see. But really, um, oh, you know, all of these are going to have live demos. So, you know, we always say don't work with uh, children, uh, animals or live code. Uh, they're doomed to uh, mishaps. But just to start with, it's kind of why we're we in discussion challenge languages. What is a challenger language? Well, something called the Toby Index. It's the importance of being in uh, yeah, earnest. Based on an Oscar, Oscar Wilde play, it's an aggregation of searches and questions on things like Google and Google Stack Overflow. Kind of gives some indication of the popularity of a given language based on the number of chi uh, number of lines of code submitted. Um, so in this case, for, for these screenshots, we tend to show the top ten. Now, so if you see here, well, C is number one. That's because you have to write a lot of code to get anywhere in C. Then we've got Java. I mean, most people know that we're doing a lot of delivery in Java, that should be fairly obvious. Uh, and the C Sharp and C++ and Visual Basic, uh, um, straight JavaScript. I mean, and this, this is the reason why in this Challenger Languages series, we're not including Python because it's at number three. It's, it's a, one can say like, if you're at number three, you're not really a challenger anymore. Um, but some of the languages in the world, the languages on this, uh, on this series of talks, well, they're not in this top 10. So like, well, why cover them? Well, see, the thing is, if you look at what's most loved, I mean, what people really like working with, and there's another one as well, most wanted. Um, well, C sharps are slack sidles its way in there, and so does JavaScript. But really, if you look at the rest of them, well, there's, there's Rust, uh, which is uh, what George covered. TypeScript, what we're talking about today. Python, which is the big intersect between the two. Kotlin and Go. And Clojure is just out of the top 10 here. Um, so you see that actually what, what, people, um, what people love um, versus what they're actually using is quite a different stack of technologies. Now, the most dreaded. So if you notice, Java makes its way into the most dreaded. Um, VBA, uh, I think, is no real surprise it's the top. Um, and, C, and C Sharp actually just comes in at number 11. So really there's um, some of the languages we're using in quite um, common usage are um, actually now most dreaded rather than our most loved. So really uh, we, we kind of, we've got a lot of choices. It's very clear we're not always using the languages we love and kind of, well, why? And the answer is sort of around, some of this is around context, I think. So, there's, so just before going into the sort of the actual um, meat of TypeScript, well, there's a broad set of types of languages. So there's your old-fashioned interpreters, interpretive languages. So JavaScript originally was interpreted; it's a bit more complicated than that now. You've got things like Basic and Lisp, and these are the ones that tend to it gets um, executed based on reading the file and parsing, which tends to be slow, but it's very easy. There's a um, lowest common denominator. And you've got the compiled languages, and these tend to be compiled onto a platform, onto a specific platform. So C and C++ being kind of the typical examples. But things like Go and Rust as well, they're, they're compiled. Um, there's Haskell as well. Then you've got your, on the right here, you've got your virtual machine-based languages, the ones that compile the code down into what we would call an intermediate language or byte code. Uh, depending on which virtual machine you use. They both operate on, both the JVM and the .NET CLR operate on very, very similar um, basis. Um, but in there, you've got some of the really kind of loved languages. So, you know, Kotlin's a JVM language, Clojure is a JVM language. Um, so if we're not just limited to Java and C Sharp .NET for those. Um, and actually what I found is these, these um, 
VM-based languages, the actual um, performance has really um, closed the gap between compiled and VM-based languages. But the main thing with these ones is um, these are what we call write once run anywhere. Uh, you can should be able to drop this the code that you've built in Kotlin or in say F sharp and run them on any, any platform that's got a, a, a .NET or a JVM runtime. So it really depends. There is no one language that suits all. I mean, people have got different par they've got different paradigms, different memory management styles. So some of them are um, kind of garbage collected. Some of them are in time garbage collected. Some of them kind of uh, stop the world garbage collected. So there's a bunch of different kind of usage paradigms. So really there is no one language that rules them all. Um, they're, they're, they are used based on what you need out of a language really and what kind of platform you're targeting. Way. So with that in mind, I'm just going to move briefly to TypeScript. So first of all, well, what is TypeScript? So it's an open source programming language developed and maintained by Microsoft. It's, now this is important, this is really important, one of the key things, it's a strict syntactical superset of JavaScript. So what it means is, if you open a TypeScript file, you can paste JavaScript into that TypeScript file and it will work. T JavaScript is valid TypeScript. And that, that is the, one of the interesting key features of TypeScript. Um, TypeScript transpiles into raw JavaScript. So uh, it's not a, a kind of, you can't just run TypeScript directly, it gets transpiled. So unlike being a compiled or, or something that uses an intermediate language, like a VM-based language, it's just get, this is a transpiled language. Um, so all existing JavaScript programs are valid TypeScript programs. <laughs> so, it, I mean, it's developed and maintained by Microsoft, which might, be, might surprise you because uh, in the past they were not so um, good at doing open source stuff. And now with the things like the .NET Core runtime, uh, that's actually becoming, uh, the, 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 the world is changing a little bit. First appeared in 2012, so it's kind of mature. It's about eight years old, but it's been in rapid de development. They are now on version four beta. And each version, they bring in a whole host of new, interesting features. <laughs> One of the main things is that with by TypeScript, hence the name type, it can be strongly typed. And it also, it has better support for own generic programming. So that means it's actually got, it's better suited to people who come from maybe a slightly stricter, um, more statically typed uh, language. This gives people a little bit more of a kind of a leg up into this world. So and one of the other things there really is, is, is TypeScript. It's, we've, there's been a number of things like Dart and CopyScript. There's been a number of alternatives to JavaScript before. We have been here before. Why is this different? And the, and the key difference is because it's a syntactical superset of JavaScript, you don't have to learn a completely different style of programming. So you kind of automatically start off on a slightly easier footing than using Coffee or uh, Dart. But currently, according to the Toby Index, well, it's not very far up there. It's at number 44. That makes me kind of sad. But I don't think that's necessarily the whole picture. So if we look at the Red Monk Index here, um, you can see the actual um, grow, grow, growth in usage. Is um, Blue being the TypeScript one is incredibly sharp. Um, now, so on Red Monk Index, um, I think a couple of years ago, it was at number 17. It's now at number nine uh, as in the first quarter of 2020. It's the allegedly the fastest growing programming language in usage. So that's really interesting. So I think in maybe if I was doing this in a year's time, I wouldn't be able to call this a challenger language anymore. It would be up there with kind of the likes of Python, as in we're just using it. So um, I think this is, this is, a, this is a, obviously something like this always going to be a slightly uh, moving target. So if you look at the most pop popular technologies, well, um, TypeScript is starting to come up there now. If you look at the actual most, sort of most popular, in the, this is the Stack Overflow, um, Stack Overflow um, index, uh, so JavaScript and, and Java and C Sharp still there. But, but um, TypeScript is starting to come up there. It's actually overtaken C++. We've already, shown, we've already shown this earlier on, but basically, it is now one of the most loved programming languages. 
some of the benefits of, of, JavaScript, of TypeScript, why would we be interested in it? Well, if you are working on a large team or set of teams, um, the idea of having typing and interface or into development, are you working to a contract is kind of um, beneficial, it's attractive. It helps you deal with growing teams, really. Um, it's also got great tooling uh, support. We'll go over some of the tooling. Uh, so IDE framework and test framework um, support later on. It's also got ES Next compliance. It's always keeping it with uh, the ECMAScript uh, Next. Uh, in, in many cases, it feels like TypeScript almost is kind of your ES Edge test, as in the stuff that they put into TypeScript that eventually finds its way into, into ECMAScript or what the people call sort of the JavaScript specification later on. Because it's a bit safer, because it allows you to put some guardrails in place and it's compiled, it actually helps you refactor stinky code. If you've got stinky code, you can put some of the TypeScript safety in place and then uh, as long as you've got the right tests in as well, you can start refactoring it and it starts feeling a bit safer. Um, it's got proven ability to, uh, to enhance code quality understandably. Large teams like um, Google, Microsoft and Facebook have continually arrived at this conclusion when it comes to large scale stuff. So you, it increases your agility in refactoring. Um, it's also, because it's got more type information and other things in there, it's actually kind of a, it's good as a form of documentation for handover as well. It makes it, because you have proper function signatures, it makes it really quite um, good as a nice of the, the code being a source of documentation. Um, help, because it's um, better suited for O and, uh, o and type, uh, type safe code, it's better for writing what we call solid codes, so single responsibility, open closed, uh, interface segregation and dependency inversion as well. It also, because the, the TypeScript compiler doesn't just, it isn't just raw JavaScript, what it does is it allows you to compile to different various versions of JavaScript. So what you can do is you can actually down compile TypeScript into older versions of the ES. So you can go all the way up to like ES4, or ES5. So you can take some of the nice modern features that you don't, that you don't get in, in the old um, TypeScript versions and what you can do is you can down compile it to them and it'll add loads of fuss and I'll show you, I'll show you some examples where you down compile it to old versions and, and it looks horrible but that's okay because you don't have to write it, the compiler does it for you. Some of the companies that I mentioned, um, Google and Microsoft, etc. but there's a load of big companies. There's over two and a half thousand company, large scale companies using job, uh, TypeScript. Um, including a lot of major client-side frameworks themselves, which I'm going to go over later. And people are using this for a mixture of uh, front-end stuff and also back-end stuff, so sort of Node and uh, Deno. Uh, not these, these people aren't using TypeScript exclusively, but understand that, you know. In fact, not, most of these companies are not using an exclusive technology, they're using a, um, a mixture of technologies as part of their landscape. So actually, you know, people like Reddit and Slack, you know, they're using, they're using it heavily and in some cases people are using it as absolute are using it as an absolute core of their enterprise however though just for balance uh, for balance of this uh, discussion well uh douglas crockford who's a known uh types well javascript uh, guru he's not a fan of it he thinks that really actually this is um it's too far. He prefers pure functional, pure typeless, um, pure uh, duct typed JavaScript. So he really is, is I mean, there's an, the, I always joke, there's no way of actually writing JavaScript without making Douglas Crockford angry. And I think um, this is another one of these cases. He, he, he's not, he doesn't see the value in it, um, but he's also a through and through Java developer. He's not a C sharp developer or Java developer who's um, kind of, moving into JavaScript because he has to. He's, he's through and through a JavaScript developer and always has been. So his, his, um, his opinion is just that. It's a very strong opinion based on being kind of a very partisan, being a very partisan thing. So one of the things, well, okay, if you're writing TypeScript, the code becomes more of a book. So you're having to put more stuff in because you're having to put typing information. And also, it's true, so ES6 and onwards have actually, do have most of the TypeScript features, you know, a good chunk of them, because they've introduced things like the pop-up class keyword and things like that in there. Um, 
Yes, it does have a lot of features. And over time, there's a good chance that all, almost all of the features of TypeScript will just get absorbed into the ES uh, spec, in which case TypeScript will, will uh, disappear. But does that mean it's not worth learning? In the meantime, I'd say not, because actually you are getting used to some of the features of the new versions of JavaScript just by doing TypeScript. The typing system is more complex than raw JavaScript, because it has one. Um, it needs to be transpiled. So it means you have to put a build step in somewhere. They are talking about um, JavaScript engines that will actually take in TypeScript and automatically transpile it. They're not there yet, but I wouldn't think it's beyond the realm of possibility that people do that. Um, now, in order to actually uh, use a regular JavaScript uh, library with TypeScript, they, they create little kind of export files with all of the type, like basically like a type system um, export um, that makes it easier to work with. Um, but not everything has that. All the major frameworks have it, but not everything has it. So you'd have to be working effectively with untyped, which would be more difficult. Um, and one of the things is because it's compiled and it's got strict typing, people think that that's a whole safety net. I think people think that's like all of your safety. Well, actually, you still got to write unit tests and you've still got to have you know, a linter and you've still got to have other things on there to, to ensure you are safe. Because otherwise, just having type safety doesn't make you safe. So when we say strong, strong typing, what does that mean? Well, JavaScript has something called duck typing. If you have two, um, two objects, both with the same signatures and both with the same fields, it will treat them as being exactly the same type. But as we know, so the old joke about duck typing is if it, if it um, walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. But what about um, mechanical ducks? Mechanical ducks aren't real ducks. Wooden ducks aren't real ducks. So um, that can be dangerous sometimes to treat, treat things that look the same as being the same because they might not be quite the same. And it's done at runtime and it's very, um, it's very uh, permissive. So, so the strong typing at uh, TypeScript happens at compile time. It doesn't do anything beyond that because by, by that point it's, it's raw JavaScript. Um, so that's one of, one of the things about is, is this strongly typing, but then there's also was one thing I was really hoping that the um, text would solve was be the, 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 um, tr the truthiness problem. So in, in JavaScript, you've got a bunch of stuff that um, evaluates the true or false when you wouldn't imagine it to. So zero uh, actually evaluates the false. I think, what? How can, how can zero evaluate the false? That makes no sense. Uh, and also, uh, you know, the, the string true um, assert, uh, evaluates to true, but I think the string false also evaluates to true. So it's really confusing, I think, in JavaScript, the whole truth in this thing. And, and TypeScript, because TypeScript's a strict superset of JavaScript, and thus any valid type, uh, JavaScript is valid TypeScript, we can't fix this immediately. However, TypeScript has got some nice uh, null coalescing, null, null check safety features that kind of help a little bit with truthiness. So basically we have a different number, we have more type annotations uh, in, uh, in TypeScript. Uh, so you have number string boolean, uh, their best standards. You've got, a, you've got enumerated types and they're basically just a bit of syntactic sugar, but they're nice to read. You've got a void type. Um, you've got a never, which is basically something that should never be, never be passed. Uh, array, tuple, which is types of objects. Any, which is effectively untyped things. So if you want to pass something around untyped in, in TypeScript, you can use the any. An unknown, which is a slightly more specialized case of any. So we have this sort of slightly more complicated typing system, but it's really not that, it's really not that um, hard, really. So let's have a little look at some language features. This is the bit you'll enjoy. So what I'm going to do, Rather than faffing in an idea, I'm going to use a TypeScript playground because you can do this too. So in the, in the uh, left here is a code. The right here is going to be my, uh, any kind of errors or console logs and also my transpiled JavaScript. So when I run something, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to see what, Java, what JavaScript comes out from TypeScript. So I'm going to start with the very, very simple case. If I'm going to here, I'm going to put... Um, Hello world, everything has to have a hello world. So I've got a message that is a string and I'm gonna log it. So let's have it just run that. That should be plainly obviously what it does. It runs there, hello world. I'm just gonna kind of clear that log. Let me, so now 
if I look at the JavaScript, if you see the JavaScript here, um, it's almost the same, apart from the fact you put use strict on there. Um, and also it has removed that typing. So we've got this thing that says message string here, it just says message. So it's very, very, very similar because this is also a very simple uh, example. So let's have a look at some type safety here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a function that adds two things together, but I'm going to do it wrong. So I'm going to put here function add. Yeah. I'm going to go add A and B up. I'm going to return A plus B. I'm going to Log that out. So I'm going to log that. So I've got my val. So what I've got my val. And here's I'm going to make a mistake. And I'm going to say, I want to call it, uh, I'm going to put the number in a string by accident because I'm being a bit dim. Now remember, bear in mind, these are very contrived examples. So um, actually what could happen is this could be, these could be parameters somewhere within the system where it's not obvious. So now, we'll run that. Why is that, I must have typed that wrong. It's in the first line, it's MVVAL instead of MI. All oh, right, thank you. Yeah, I'm looking on a very small screen, thank you. Couldn't see it, there we go. Right, never went with live code. So here we go, if we run this, it'll run. And if I scroll down here, what is this 54? Well, you think, well, five plus four, that doesn't equal 54, what's going on there? Well, that's because obviously it's a string, it coerces this into a string now. So actually what I want to say is, actually I want to make this safer, I want to say, I want to say that actually my add, I'm adding numbers up here. So if I go here, I go uh, number, this is how we do this. And then what's going to happen is, oh, and there's now, now I've got, a, and now I've got a, an error come up. And what, what is this error telling me? And this error is saying, you let's have a look. Oh, it's a string, it's not assignable to probably to type of number, okay. So maybe I'll start, I'll start um, typing these up as well. Well, of course, that's going to immediately throw up a wobbler because that's not a number there. So, okay, make that number. I'll make this one a number as well to be consistent. And now we have, well, obviously it's going to return nine. Uh, that means that, well, okay, we will fix that problem through the use of safe typing. And if we look at the JavaScript, it just looks like my original example. It's taken all of that out, but this is a compile time check to make sure you're not messing up. So let's have a little look at classes. Now classes um, don't look too much different than ES6. So if I take a base class, call it animal. So this, if you look at the ES6 example here, uh, it's part of removing these type declarations, it looks much the same, class, blah, 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 it looks very much the same. So I'm going to extend that animal using the extends keyword, which is very similar to in Java. I'm going to take, I'm going to create uh, a cat in the centipede, and again, the output. Now, here's where the difference is. If I um, take my tsconfig back, and I have to run this all the way back to ES5, so we're talking back in the dark ages, and then we look at the output. So this means this is backwards compatible with very old browsers. But if you look at the output, if you were trying to do this functionality on ES5, that's what you'd have to code. And that's significantly uglier. I mean, 
significantly uglier. So that takes all of that away from you. But uh, given we're in this century, let's just drop this back up to a later version. This is what we get. Now, so what we can do is very simply is we can take we can take uh, instances. So in this case, this is an untyped. So this is you know you can put this to any. And if you run these, well, they do exactly what you expect them to do. Well, we can we can be we can see if I, I I can be I can be type safe here. If I think Tom should be a cat and I try and create a centipede, so one thing we can do on in advance of this that ES six still doesn't have is we can create abstract classes. So let's create this here. Yeah? This is an abstract class. It's, it's got the word abstract in front of it. It's got a constructor, but the key, the key thing is it's got an abstract method. And it must be implemented by the derived classes. So I take here, there's the accounting department and the printing department, so the postal department. So the accounting department's got an extra function on top, but they both implement uh, print meeting. So if I just alter this one and just change it, what it'll do then is it'll give me a warning and say, uh, give me an error and say, actually, the non abstract class must does not in, uh, implement the inherited abstract member. So what this does is gives you effectively like a template of methods. It gives you things that you must implement, um, which is really useful. And you can use the template method pattern with this. So what I've got here is, is two, but um, uh, the accounting department has got generate reports as well, which is which the postal department does not. So what I'm just going to do is I'm going to use these. So what I can do now is if I create, um, one thing I can see here is if I try and instantiate the abstract class, abstract classes can't be created. That's the point because they don't have a full implementation. So if I try and create a new department, which should make sense, it will go bang. And you say, well, actually, can't create an instance in an abstract class. That's how, just how, I think almost this, the same thing as, uh, same way as um, Java works. So if I now create um, an accounting department instead, and see what I'm going to do here, create an accounting department and I print the name, print the meeting, fine. Now, also, if you notice here, I've done this whole, I've done the whole um, effectively dependency inversion kind of uh, and the inheritance and polymorphism thing. This is a polymorphic behavior. I've said the department's a type of department, but actually I've created a new accounting department. So if I just try and, uh, if I just try and use generate reports directly, it's going to say, well, generate reports isn't part of the account, uh, part of the department object, it's part of the accounting department only. It's, it's unique to that one. So what we can do is we can say, we can ask, is uh, the department an instance of accounting department, if it is, then actually use it as an accounting department. And then what I can do is I can, I can do run generate reports. And this again should be unsurprising. It says account, account uh, department name is accounting and auditing, uh, it meets its run to name, and then it generates the accounting reports. If I do the same with the postal department, which doesn't have the generate reports functionality, I can use the same kind of code. Here, create a new postal department. Now, because I'm going to do the same check, is it an accounting department? If it is, I'm going to treat it as one. And what I'll find that here is actually, it's going to say wrong department because it's not an accounting department. So run that and say, yeah, wrong department. So this gives us kind of our um, polymorphism and inheritance, which is very useful if you're trying to do O style code. And again, if I just look at the TypeScript output here, the JavaScript output here, all of that um, abstract class stuff has just disappeared because it's compile time only. All this bit here just completely gone. Really, it doesn't. It, it's uh, this is this the compiler's take this out because this is just for, co for compile time checking only. 
I've got interfaces as well. Interface is good because you can spread interface across different uh, inheritance trees. So if we've got, I'm going to create a nameable interface. A nameable interface, well, it means they've got a name. And animals are nameable. Great. Um, I will say that a rhino extends the class of animal. Fine. And then we'll say an employee also is nameable. So that means they can both, they can both um, implement nameable. So you've got the implements keyword there, the implement nameable, but they're not the same, they're not the same um, inheritance tree. So what we can do is we can say, right, we can create um, animal rhino employee. Now, if I try and if I try, because animals of type uh, animal of type animal there, if I try and coerce the employee into animal, it's going to give me a type safety error. So as well, you, yeah, it's different, it's different, different, uh, you know, different de de declaration of property name. Now, in JavaScript, that would probably work because it doesn't have this type checking because it's duct type. Because if you look at the um, animal and the employee. Um, Signatures are the same. They've both got a name, they've both got a um, print name function, they've both got a constructor that looks the same. So actually in JavaScript, this would be perfectly fine, but they're not the same thing. Um, but what we can do is you can treat them via their interface. You can treat them via their interface instead. What we can do and say is in ask them by name also to see, um, Say name nameable is a rhino. Okay, so you know you know rhinos are nameable because it's on this tree, and you can also assign it employees. Say employees is named um, because that's also from nameable. So you can do the same kind of thing. You can do this proper um, inter inter uses of interfaces, which is much, which is very flexible. Again, it allows for uh, dependency inversion, dependency injection. <laughs> so we have read-only properties as well. Realize we're running short on time. Read-only properties. So what we have is you have something called read-only. Again, this is completely gone in, in the uh, JavaScript here. And you say this, this code, and so read-only means it's uh, in the constructor or in or assigned here only. So if I create something and, and it gets set in the constructor and then I try and reset it later on, it gives you this kind of nice immutability kind of aspect that says, uh, yeah, it's read-only. And again, this is stripped entirely out of um, JavaScript. We also have null safety. So if we um, take something like a user, that's we'll take it nullable, um, and then I try and if I try and if I try and just do this, let user uh, yet user occupation equal to user occupation. What's going to happen is that's going to blow up because that's a null, that's a null reference because this is null. So if I dereference this, it's just going to go bang. And it says bang. Yeah. So what we can do in JavaScript and use the old style um, and operator and say, well, actually, uh, this works. But this is more, this is, this is, this is kind of null, null feature is a little bit more, is a bit more um, readable in TypeScript is basically this question mark says it says this may be null. So if this is null, uh, don't try and get the occupation. So what this what this um, does is it lets you have a slightly more um, first code pass. So if just do this, and it says let uh, occupation. If that's not null, set so the occupation. So in this case, it will be undefined because it what so because it's um, because that, that uh, user is null, but at least it doesn't crash. Now, what you can do as well is you can take um, is there is something in, there is a feature in JavaScript where you can say um, you can use the all operator. 
So you say uh, my value or or and then you can actually give it to itself a default value if it's null and say that my value or, or, or 20. So if it's null, then um, return 20. Now, there's also one called question mark, question mark, it's kind of like an Elvis operator. So, and these two, if I've got this as null, these, these behave the same. So if I just do this, they both return 20, that's great. Now, there's a trick, there's a trick in JavaScript, there's a, there's a kind of, then this goes back to the falsiness and truthness thing. If I do this, zero defaults is um, evaluated to false. So what I expect here is this, if I'm doing a null check, I'd say that I'd expect um, this to return zero. But if you look at the raw JavaScript one, it actually still returns 20. But this TypeScript, this TypeScript functionality here is a genuine null check. It says if it's null or undefined, return 20. But if it's actually zero, which it returns to false in JavaScript, return, you know, return that, that value. So this is, this is kind of a, a new, safer way of dealing with nulls. You also have um, the idea of being able to check, kind of chain these together and check something if, if um, a value is, is null um, and create default values. So here we go. I've got, a create, I've got a user that's null. I say, if I want to get the user's age, if the user's not null, and if, you know what, if the user is null, I can provide a default value. So again, it's kind of back the Elvis operator style thing. So if I've got, if we've got a completely null user or the user.age itself is null, um, then I will get, 99. So if I run this, obviously it's going to give me, it'll give me 99 at the bottom. Why is it not working? Ah. I think I've run up scroll space. That's inconvenient. So basically, oh no, I've got a console.log it. But anyway, um, this, this, this returns you 99, which is, which is much more helpful than having to manually uh, roll your own nulls. So also you've got something on top of this called generics. So it allows you to create um, generic classes. So if you've got say like a generic number, you can use the angle bracket syntax. They say here you've got angle bracket T, which is your template type. You say, well, in this case, we'll have a zero uh, value. You want to have an add function and a constructor. And what you can do is then you can create yourself um, you can create yourself a version of that in this case. I'm going to say uh, generic number, type number with a default with a zero value of zero, and then put your own, your, your own um, add functionality. So you can basically create gener generic uh, implementations like this. And one final thing is the, the syntactic sugar of enums. So what you could do. You can just use the enumerated type, enum type here. And then what it does, it lets you refer to the IntelliSense. And if I just put kind of something in here that doesn't exist, it'll say, uh, no, it's not part of that enum. And that kind of gets compiled down to some not quite so readable JavaScript. So you have to avoid all this kind of uh, IAFE kind of blocking out, which looks a little bit ugly. But basically, you can create like kind of string, uh, string name value pair uh, enums out of the box, which is useful as uh, just a bit of syntactic sugar. So what else do we get? Well, we get that enhanced typing um, model. Uh, you get um, type aliasing as well, that explicit dynamic and weak typing through things like any and unknown. Um, we get modules and namespaces, even we can even use modules before modules are introduced into ES. Uh, we've got the uh, much nicer wrapper around their sync weights as well. ID support, all the major IDs support it, even Eclipse if you are really into that kind of thing. Uh, ew. Um, but things like uh, WebStorm's brilliant, NetBeans, IntelliJ, they're all great. It's treated as a first-class citizen. Um, one of the other things is it, all of the major, really all of the big hitter um, JavaScript frameworks uh, use uh, TypeScript. In fact, Angular is entirely written in TypeScript, which is brilliant. So they've actually, um, mig they've actually migrated to that entirely. Um, 
View has got uh, tooling support, uh, Node.js and Express. So Express has got a bunch of uh, exports you can use as well for uh, type, TypeScript, which is great. So you can, you, you can write all of these uh, using TypeScript. Also, all of the testing frameworks. So originally there's some ideas, maybe we should actually write TypeScript specific testing libraries. And they went, hang on a second, all of the existing JavaScript testing libraries are good enough. What they've done is they've created a bunch of, uh, again, it's kind of the type exports and things on top of it. Um, Cypress ships with TypeScript, de TypeScript declarations out of the box by default. So you can use Cypress, Jasmine, Mocker, and Jest. You just have to go and ask for those libraries. Um, and they all work as well. So you can just use your regular JavaScript testing frameworks and you'll be absolutely fine. We also got static code analysis. So what's something called TSLint, which is the TypeScript version of the SLint, which is a version of JSLint. Um, but actually over the time is the, the agreed, there's been an agreement to actually roll all the TSLint features into ESLint, which again makes, it goes back to use the same testing frameworks, use the same JavaScript frameworks, use the same static analysis frameworks. So if you've got a mixture of, you've got a good testing framework, you've got a good baseline framework you're working on, you've got a good linter, and you've got also the compiler checking your code. If you've got all of those things in your CI pipeline, then what you have out the back of that is hopefully very high quality code. This gives you kind of a, 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 you know, a lot of potential wins. So should you be using JavaScript? Well, depends on your team size, really. Um, and you develop a maturity. Not everybody is good at programmers Doug Croft. In fact, probably most people are. Um, he might not want the syntactic sugar, but actually you probably do. If you're writing something very complicated, honestly, I think the, the, the small extra cost of type, uh, putting the type safety is probably worth it. Especially if you're open sourcing stuff and other people are going to be faffing with it and write the code. I'd say putting in that compile check in there is probably a great thing. If you're a small team though, using, making use of the flexible nature of um, JavaScript and, and really going, going kind of off the wall with it, it might not be for you. It might be a little bit too far. So really, TypeScript's in addition to JavaScript. It's a superset. It's a really useful one. It'll continue to align with the ECMAScript. Um, in fact, if anything, over time, TypeScript might just be 100% uh, subsumed into it. It might just cease to exist. Um, if you, if you work on a JavaScript project, you can easily add TypeScript. Apart from a TS compiler, there's almost nothing to do. You can migrate all of your code over gradually. You can do it bit by bit. You can change the um, target to different output, different ES versions. You can gradually retire old versions. And I think basically it allows you a way of progressively enhancing your code without making a big upfront time commitment. Uh, and that is it. So I've got questions. Any questions, anybody? So somebody asked, would you consider using Dart instead of TypeScript? Well, Dart's kind of got a very different format. I mean, one thing is Dart, you have to learn an entirely different language. Dart is very much, it's kind of a scripting framework and it's designed to use, um, use a, number, a number of different kind of paradigms really to, to JavaScript. It's designed to have a different coding style entirely. Dart is great if you want to do certain things. I think you want to go down that route because Dart's Google technology. If you want to go down that route, it's great. But I think if you are part of an existing team, then actually TypeScript might be an easier sell, frankly. Um, do we have a GitHub with examples? There's actually loads of examples. I can provide links after this. We can send them out after this uh, presentation of sort of some example um, repositories with TypeScript in. A lot of our, a lot of our, and a lot of our and um, projects use TypeScript because we found it to be very productive. In fact, I'd say probably about 50 or 60 percent of our JavaScript projects and now we use TypeScript, and that's taken off a lot. Maybe two or three years ago, you didn't really hear of it. Anybody else? Yes. So yeah, if you want to, if you want to, if you have an existing JS project, it's very easy. So basically, you put the TS compiler into your into your um, build pipeline, which is very simple. And what you do is you basically start to rename your JS files as TS files, and they'll get compiled because because JavaScript is valid TypeScript. You effectively should just be able to pass through compiler almost. Uh, you might get some warnings for things like, oh, you should put in any types in, but, it's, but it'll work. And what you can do then is you can gradually start converting one by one the, the import the risky bits first into TypeScript by putting all of the type defini definitions in there, cleaning stuff up to use the slightly more um, 
the, the nicer bits of the syntax. So yes, you can you can you can do it that way. So um, so Tim Berners Lee's project in Rupp have started um, replacing their old fashioned JavaScript with a with uh, TypeScript gradually, and it works just fine. Um, and the future of TypeScript will it replace JavaScript? More like JavaScript, I think, will absorb the uh, the features of TypeScript. I think ja uh, JavaScript will absorb it. Um, because it's already happened with things like the class annotations, um, the, cl the class keyword, I think eventually more and more of these features will just get absorbed. And it will be more like in JavaScript, it will be optional if you wanted to strongly type stuff. I think, and then like, like ES, uh, ESLint's absorbed TSLint. So I think eventually there will be no TypeScript eventually. It's just that it will, uh, JavaScript will have kind of become TypeScript. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. If you want to stay on for a quick chat afterwards, then I've got five minutes. Uh, thank you for listening in. You can unmute yourself if you want to and, and uh, speak freely.